Simon, welcome to Waterstones. Thank you very much. Um, it feels not like, a bad view. Well, hey, it's not a bad view. You can see pretty much the whole of London from our little penthouse up here. Little You've penthouse. seen far more than London, of course, in your time. I have, but <laughs> it's quite rare to get up in high in London. Yeah. And it's a lovely part of... Yeah, well, thanks. I'm just saying thanks for inviting us up. It's a pleasure to, to have penthouse. you here. I feel slightly weird having you sort of here in a chair being so used to seeing you out in the world sort of exploring. Well, we should have gone for a walk or something. Well, maybe we should have, yeah, we should have. We'll do that next time <laughs> for, the, for the next interview. Um, Part two. Me, <laughs> reading your memoir, people have seen you, you on TV, they've seen you adventure, yeah. adventuring, and you have been in a fair few scrapes in your time. But I was very intrigued to see that you got into scrapes very, very early mm. in your life. And in fact, as a very young child, your first brush with death came came with meningitis that was followed by tonsillitis that was followed by pneumonia and you're a bit like a cat that has several lives but you seem to use up quite a few quite early on um, yeah I haven't counted no um, <laughs> but possibly yes no I had a few uh, tricky moments definitely in early life just from uh, illnesses that can hit anybody but perhaps I was a little bit more unlucky than most and yes I suppose there have been one or two moments in adult life as well uh, when the a few lives have, have ticked down, but I'm pretty sure I've got pretty sure I've got at least a couple left. I think you've got a few left. Yeah, certainly. I think so. I, I have ta I did tally it up at one point and think, uh, but now I think it's all right. There's a great, uh, was not a great moment, obviously, because you were suffering from malaria at the time. But right. you, you, there's a really in wonderful your, time in really, my life that was. Yeah. But, I suppose in your in your feverish state, you you thought you were sort of talking to Mr. T, who was your childhood yeah. hero, and I wanted, if we could, to just just tap into that. Like, why was Mr. T your hero? I wonder what it was about him that you were particularly in awe of. So, how, was Mr. T not your childhood hero? Of, of the A-team. I'm trying to think who, whether he was. How could Mr. T not have been your childhood hero? I mean, what a, what a crazy full character. I mean, he's just, he was just great. I loved the A-team. I think it was the only... It was a, it was a program I was allowed to watch. Yeah. And I think it was just a, an important time. And obviously, each episode, for people who haven't seen it, basically the same thing happened this gang of uh, uh, wrongly accused former military folk uh, came into a small town in America and rescued people suffering at the hands of the wicked cattle baron nearby. And this invariably involved them getting locked in a, a barn with uh, a table and a chair in, and they would convert those into a tank somehow. That yep. was basically it. Yep. I, agree, I don't know if you remember it. Yeah, absolutely. But Mr. T was brilliant at welding and... He was enormous and he was reassuring and he had some fantastic one-liners and my parents made me read his autobiography when I was a kid when I was going a bit off the rails which was a massive mistake because his <laughs> autobiography was just littered with extreme uh, gang stories yeah. and the most extreme swearing almost every other paragraph I completely recommend it to any other 11 year old um, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I, 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 he was my hero. You mentioned that your, your teenage years and that you're very frank about the, the difficulties you had at that time and mm. also quite humble about the fact where you, you talk about the fact that you were quite lucky actually with the scrape that you had, but you were dealing with depression, you were dealing with drinking and drug taking and things that a lot of teenagers do, but you did mm. find yourself considering taking your own life and it was just, you were very lucky that that didn't happen. Mm. But it's clearly a very important sort of switch point in your life. Do you mind telling us a bit about how you, I suppose, how you came back from that and how that ended up actually helping you to, to do what you ended up doing. Yeah, I think uh, luck was a, has been a massive part of my life. And I think many of us imagine that we are where we are just through uh, our hard work and our incredible, natural, raw talent. But I think we underplay the role up luck has as well and luck can nudge us along different paths in life and it can give us little opportunities and I was nudged a few times and when I was very low and I think in some ways when you say you you know you my the darkness that I lived in was for quite a long period actually mm. and it wasn't a brief flirtation with ending it all it was a more protracted period of awfulness in in my life and what was quite weird actually was that I've never really looked back 
to that time. Since things started to go right for me, mm. I've never, I've never really looked back to that time of darkness and owned it, if you like. It was almost just there within me, this mm -hmm. the the fragility, and um, oh, it was quite special actually to start writing my book, my little life story, and go back over that time and cry about it and talk to my family about it. I'd never told my, I'd never told my wife or my brother uh, stories that I've put into the book. Uh, they, did, they had no idea and I had to say, look, I, I, they're okay about it, but this is how bad things got for me. And yeah, I got very, very low. I was um, pretty uh, hopeless as a student at school and for some of the reasons you mentioned, for being a bit naughty and a bit unfocused. And I managed to leave school without any real qualifications. And my heart really breaks, actually, for other kids who are like me, who, who don't have much hope. They don't have a clear path in life from school to college or school to university. Mm. And look around now. We're, the kids and all of us, we're being bombarded with images of perfection all the time. And uh, the Instagram generation has so much to cope with. And I felt that I wanted to own up, if you like, to the fact that my beginning was pretty humble and sometimes awful and sometimes very tricky. But I made a bit of a, a bit of a go of it. And the advice that carried me along was the title of the book, mm. Do Things Step by Step. Yeah, and that was advice given to me in the, in the Social Security office when I was signing on for the dole, for goodness sake. Mm. And um, it became a bit of a mantra for me. And so that's how I that was the advice I took, just to take things slowly. Uh, don't imagine you're going to aim for the stars. Um, you know, kids are told that all the time now. So I thought it might have a little bit of relevance to people I know and people I meet today who are saying, I don't know what to do with my life. I'm a bit lost. It's okay. That's my hmm. message. I was there. Don't think you can, you know, you're going to change your life overnight. But taking it slowly can be a bit of an answer. People will have seen you on TV traveling around the world and, and assume that you have always had that kind of vista and range. Yeah. But actually, that, that idea outlook, of taking almost. things step mm. by step had a very localized focus when you took a trip to Glencoe in Scotland. And that was a hugely important turning point for you, wasn't it? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, I was very lost and um, I realized I needed to challenge myself a bit. Uh, I was going nowhere. Uh, very literally in life, I was struggling to get out of bed and go and get a newspaper from the shops to go through looking for the, looking at the job ads. And um, but I had this mad idea one morning that I was going to go on a journey, and I was going to go to Scotland. And um, you know, I I don't think I'd ever been out of London before on my own. I don't come from a wealthy, travelly family. I don't come from a uh, a connected elite part of London at all so so it wasn't that abnormal but I decided to go to Scotland and it wasn't for any really profound reasons to be honest it was just because my friend had a video of the movie Highlander that <laughs> we'd watched over and over again and and I decided to go to Scotland and I decided to go very much using the advice that I've been given by the lady in the social office uh, which is the title of the book just take it all very step by step so I thought, okay, I'll go to the train station and get a ticket. And if I can't face it, I'll just turn around and go home. But everything became possible. When I thought, okay, now I'll get on the train. I can do this. And the bizarre and the slightly extraordinary became possible for me as a, as a pretty lost little lad. And I went to Scotland and yes, I had a little experience there which helped to change my life. There's something in that experience as well, which I think is one of... One of two key character traits which I think are part of your success and one of them is this almost naivety which where you just kind of go I'll just climb up this mountain and that'll be fine even though dusk was falling everyone mm. else who's coming down the mountain was saying what are you doing yeah. um, but whether it's that or going to MI6 and saying you'd quite like to work for them oh, and the woman don't, having to that's say. so embarrassing now <laughs> but I think that any any trip idea that you've come up with has come from that same I guess, openness to kind of go, why couldn't we go there? And even though other people would be saying, no, it's not that simple. You just can't turn up in the Democratic Republic of Congo. You just go, no, it'll be absolutely fine. There'll be a well, way. Maybe, maybe the, the younger experiences have made me more open to possibilities as an adult. Uh, because, yes, I did do something that was very challenging for me as a lad. It wasn't climbing Everest, but in a way it was for me. It, it was... Pretty, it might as well have been, for goodness sake. 
and um, I didn't realise that was what I was almost being. I'm, I don't really want to say it, but almost being called to do. Mm. I don't know if it was fate. I don't know if it was uh, a secret little voice in my head that knew I had to do something really challenging. But yeah, I went up a bit of a mountain in every possible sense, and I made it. Uh, and it was slightly against the odds and it was tricky and challenging and it did open me up to other possibilities in life. And, and I think I think that is fundamentally that is the power of of a journey, of a bit of a quest, of challenging yourself. And I'm hugely keen now to get out of my own and keep getting out of my own comfort zone and mm. keep pushing myself a bit. And I'm always trying to nudge sometimes give a bit of a shove to people around me to say look we need in life we need to keep reminding ourselves that risk is good and risk is interesting and risk is fun and it's challenging and rewarding as well so definitely we're all shaped by our life events absolutely and um and i i certainly have been and i still have the fear and fragility in some areas of being a a, a lost little teenager and i have the confidence that's come from doing some pretty bizarre and extraordinary things as a as an adult as well. well the other quality which I think is really key you're is... You're defining me here. Well, I am well, a bit... Well, you I like it. Your, Go for it. You defined yourself in the book. I You've think it's the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> but it's, the, the thing is, is empathy. Because I think that one of the things that's so engaging about your programmes is that they don't feel plotted or scripted, that there is an mm. improvised element to them. But also, you seem genuinely interested in the people that you meet and in their lives, which mm. is not the case for every programme that you watch on TV. And well, that... you could say that. I can, I can watch the <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a lovely thing for you to say. Thank you. But w w I wonder where that empathy comes from, because you, 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 th you think in the book, is it just a genetic thing? Or is it perhaps shaped by some of those things that happened to you when you were a teenager or perhaps even younger? So that illness we were talking about right at the mm. beginning, if you've been f fragile and you've been cared for by other people, does that help to teach you that crucial quality of empathy, being interested in other people's lives? I think, it, I think it's all of, it's nature and nurture, if you like. I think my family are pretty good on empathy. Um, so I've got some good DNA f with it there. And then I think it's something I've learned and I've loved as well. I like hearing people's stories. And you're right, we don't have a script on the travelogues I do. And we don't have a recce where somebody goes out ahead. We basically have to turn up places and make it up as we go along. Mm. And that's quite unusual in TV now. And it's much more exciting as a result. But I am the the most wonderful memorable experiences for me as a as a traveller as it were are encounters with other people. That's absolutely that's why I do it really and why I keep doing it and why I want to keep doing it mm. because they're so meaningful and memorable. And yeah, I I I like people's stories. I'm interested in us. It means that everywhere I go is fascinating because there's wonderful human beings with tales to tell mm. everywhere. And I, I'm sure that the experiences I've had and the fragility I felt as a teenager makes me more receptive to other people's problems. But I think also growing up in London helped. I grew up in a very uh, ethnically diverse, uh, culturally rich part of the capital uh, at a time and in a place where I was hearing lots of stories from around the world, even though I didn't get on a plane until I started working. So I was aware of the world and I heard tales from people. And I've never looked at other people and seen them as an other. They've always been, for me, our brothers and sisters on this planet. And I've been open to their, to their stories. And um, so yeah, I, I had a very tricky start in life. And um, yeah, it's, it's been painful and, and uh, freeing uh, and cathartic to go back over it just this year while while writing the book but I don't regret any of it it's mm. it's who I am it's shaped me and it's gifted me a lot as well and perhaps perhaps all right yeah maybe empathy is part of that I'm I'm gonna go and say yeah I'm empathetic and I'm happy and proud of that <laughs> just to finish off um you, you have met a lot of people in completely diverse countries as you say but you just mm. mentioned there that despite the differences despite the different cultures 
that you see them all as being sort of brothers and sisters that, that we share the planet with. Mm. You mentioned near the beginning of the book that one of your inspirations was Michael Palin, his travelogues, and he said something very similar, which is that despite traveling around the world and meeting people from completely different places, when you actually sit down and talk to them, or not even talk, because you might not even share a language, mm. you find that actually you share the same things that you care about, friends, family, yeah. love, food, drink, it's sort of, it, would you say that through all the tra travels, that's one of the biggest lessons that you've learned is that actually there is far more that unites us than separates us? I think one of the, one of the benefits of my background actually was that I almost knew that before I started traveling extensively. Mm. So I was, I, I was, I was a bit um, pre-educated on that all, all, almost. So from the start, uh, I think I, I knew that we are all pretty much the same. And whether I was talking to a um, uh, a camel herder in the middle of Kazakhstan or uh, a, a, a princess in Madagascar, uh, fundamentally, with uh, yeah, of course, human beings. When you strip it down, generally, we pretty much want the same things in in from our existence, and we need pretty much the same thing. So, I had that with me, and that really helped. But I think yeah, Michael Palin was was a complete breath of fresh air on the telly when he first started because before him uh telly travelers doing his sort of job my sort of job uh, tended to tended to you know, it could be a little bit patronizing towards the funny foreign people yeah. and often they would be physically looking down on them and and observing them with a slightly raised eyebrow and, and michael you know he he stripped that away for a lot of people and for me as well watching as a viewer and recognised them as uh, as us, and and humanised them, and and was very uh, respectful in every way. And I, I suppose, if anything, I've tried to learn a little bit from the great Mr. the great Lord Palin, and 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 carry that and as as advice and and a tactic and technique, if you like, on my journeys. Just be open to people, and it's. It's such a good little bit of advice for people traveling now, I think, because mm. so often people are told, oh, you know, the world is a scary place. Stay away from the locals. Stay in the resort or the or the town where you are. You know, mm. Don't go out. But actually, the world is a very safe and welcoming place. And, and getting out into it is, a, is an extraordinary gift. Actually, in the book, you say that for anybody who, who doesn't travel much, one thing you can do is to take a map of where you live and pop a glass on it, mm. draw a circle and make sure you explore everything within that circle first, and then you can start to widen out, can't you? Yeah, definitely. It, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a state of mind, really, isn't it? I, I mean, well, you can take what you want from exploring and from traveling. Some people will do it so they can say, I'm the first person to uh, summit these 12 mountains backwards or something. You know, they'll come up with something that's quite personal to them, fair enough. I, I like traveling because I like the experiences and meeting people. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't have to be around the planet. I think it, we all need to stay interested in our world and uh, ourselves and us collectively. And yeah, it, it, it doesn't have to be to somewhere on that's a long haul flight away. It, it, it can be local, and there's a beauty in that as well. And that, that in, inspire, you know, igniting that passion can, it, particularly in the young, in, in kids, can can be a way of. Uh, uh, leading them really mm. into into much more and a more adventurous life. So definitely, it's a recommendation. Get out, explore your own area, take a delight in knowing what's around the corner. That's how I started mm. with my grand's magical mystery tours in the back of her adapted car. It's another story, but she helped to to start the light a little bit of a fire in me, even though we weren't travelling travelling abroad. You will have to read the book to find out <laughs> what that is. Uh, but Simon, it was great to read your book. Great to hear a bit more about the sort of the background to your travels and, and, and very so inspiring much. as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. What an honour this is. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. A pleasure.